Uh, we're in week number three of a message series called The Promise of Peace, and we're looking at a very important subject, especially for right now in our culture. There's this longing for peace, so much chaos in our world, so much chaos in our lives, and we're going to talk today about the subject of how fear is attacking our peace. But before I get there, uh, I want to take a moment to share something that's coming up in just a few weeks with you. Uh, on May 19th, that weekend, in the church calendar globally and historically, uh, is called Pentecost Weekend. And the reason it's called Pentecost Weekend, that's the weekend that we celebrate the birth of the church and the moment when the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 2, Peter was preaching a sermon, and when he did, 3,000 people made a decision to follow Jesus, they got baptized, and the church was born. And so we celebrate that day every year. Um, and this year, with a celebration, we're actually going to join together with thousands of churches across California in something that's called Baptize California. And it's a great weekend because that weekend when the church was born, people got baptized. And we're saying, what if the church could unify globally around baptism on this weekend to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit into the lives of people and to celebrate that decision to follow Jesus, the birth of the church? That's a great weekend to do it. So if you've been considering for a while that decision or perhaps uh, you're new to church, new to faith, you've never gone public with your faith in Jesus, you can do that the weekend of May 19th. It's going to be an awesome moment where literally tens of thousands of people across California and the world, because our whole church is doing it, uh, are going to go public with their faith in Jesus. So if today uh, God is stirring in your heart and you've never made that decision to go public with your faith, I want to invite you, when you check in today and take your next steps, uh, to let us know that you want to be baptized and we'll follow up with you. The other thing I'll say is that some of you are new to Saddleback. We know this just kind of looking around. Um, and one of the best ways to take a next step is to go to Activate. And you've been hearing about that, but that's a great first step if you're new to Saddleback to get connected. Now, I want to jump into, with all that being said, with my little commercial, thank you for that, um, I want to jump into today's message, and I want to start with this idea that we've been talking about. There is a war on peace. I think that we can all agree. In our culture, in our world, in our lives, there, there's this constant attack pulling us, pulling our lives away from the kind of peace that God wants us to live with. And we've been looking throughout this series at some of the arrows that are flying at us right now in our world. And I want you to see this graphic. First week I talked about identity and how there's a lot of confusion in our world around identity. It seems to be one of the big conversation pieces that the message of the Bible deals with, that God sees us as his sons and daughters, that when we put our trust in him, there's this new identity that he gives to our lives, and anchoring in that helps us live with peace. Last week, Stacy, my wife, preached, and she did a great job talking about chaos in our circumstances or uncertainty and how God can give us peace through uncertainty, confidence because he's with us. Today we're going to look at fear and how to move forward with fear when we have fear and experience God's peace in the midst of uncertain future. And then finally next week we're going to come to relationships. We're going to talk about how broken relationships often are warring at our peace. And today as we're talking about the subject of fear, I wanted to share something interesting with you. Um, there's this book that was written by a guy named Barry Glasner, and he wrote the book called The Culture of Fear. And in this book, what he does is he talks about the last hundred years of human history, and he compares us now to a hundred years ago, and he says his assumption in the book through study is that we are in the most fearful time in human history. And what's ironic about this is if you compare now to 100 years ago, uh, the life expectancy now is twice as long as it was 100 years ago. And there's more access to medicine to heal diseases than there's ever been, but there's more fear. And you've got to ask the question, why? So he kind of pulls together some stats, and this is very fascinating. In a recent 10-year period in American history, murder in the U.S. went down by 20%. Yet murder stories on network news went up by 600%. So there's a message of fear that is coming at us. And I will make an assumption based on my understanding of the Bible that at its core, the enemy is trying to get us to live in fear, that fear is demonic. 
in its core, that the effort of fear is to destroy our lives. Now, there's a part of our response in chaos and circumstances that is God's natural kind of built-in mechanism to respond to danger, but the enemy wants to take fear, that fear response, and put it in our hearts that it becomes the theme of our lives and neutralizes our faith. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna give us some framework to look at fear. I want us to think about how fear affects us, and then I want us to talk about how do we move forward in the face of fear. And I wanna break it down, first of all, by starting and recognizing there's one type of fear that is the fear that emerges in immediate danger. So this last week I was in Washington uh, with my wife, Stacy, and we went hiking, and uh, one of my buddies who lives there in eastern Washington let me know that the mountain that we're hiking on, the mountain we were hiking on had a bear attack recently. And so he tells me this right before I'm about to go hike. So the whole time, my eyes are open to the reality that there might be immediate danger around me. And I'm not entirely nervous because I was a wrestler and I know that if a bear comes, I can wrestle it. I'll take care of my girl. I'll watch out for her. And so my eyes are up. I'm alert to the thing that might be a danger around me. And so I'm walking kind of with my eyes. And if a bear were to come, that heart you know, immediate response in my heart, there would be a fight or flight natural tendency to kick in or kind of this energy that will say either you turn and punch the bear or you run, either, either one. And that's God's mechanism that when there is danger, you respond. When there is danger, you respond. And what happens is that fear gets into our minds and takes us out of God's design. Now, I'll explain it like this. Isaiah 26, 3. I love this verse. This is the theme verse for our series. Isaiah is speaking. He says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Now, in your notes, I want to encourage you to circle that word mind because when Isaiah uses that word, there's a very significant meaning to that word. One of my favorite things about Saddleback being on staff here at Saddleback is having a resident theologian, Pastor Buddy Owens. And so a lot of times during the week, I'll go into his office. He's one of our teaching pastors, if you don't know him. And we'll talk about my sermon. He'll give me ideas and thoughts. And um, he let me know this week that that word in the original Hebrew language, that word mind means imagination. And I'll have you know, I did check it. He was right. So just in case you were wondering. The internet agrees with him. So the, that one word, though, Isaiah is using means imagination. So he's saying, I want to come back to it, you will keep in perfect peace him whose imagination, whose mind is steadfast, is focused because he trusts in you. So fear and faith both have an imagination. Now, coming back to the different categories of faith, there is the type of fear that is immediate danger. It's a natural response. In your notes, I want to encourage you, you can write this down. The first natural response is immediate danger. But the imagination of fear, after that immediate danger, there's another fear response that kicks in. And the second one is a mindset that starts to go towards impending battles. So the, the mind, the imagination starts to think about things that might happen in the future, a battle that I might have to face. And what the enemy is trying to do, he's trying to freeze you so that you don't move forward in faith. So that impending battle also, as you're thinking about it, leads you to a place where you might start considering imaginary problems. Anybody have any imaginary friends that you fight with from time to time? And sometimes fear can cause you to imagine problems that don't exist. I have this happen sometimes. I have a deep fear. One of my, my fears that I wrestle through is a fear of losing one of my family members, deeply loving them. And there are moments where I will hear a siren and all of a sudden my mind goes through. You know, okay, where, where, is, where is Stacy? Where are the kids? You know, and I'll play out a whole scenario in my mind. I'll map out if she's going to, something happened, an accident happened. In fact, the other day, this is interesting, I forgot this in the other messages. Um, the other day, her watch is connected to her heart. And so there was, it, uh, it's connected to my phone as well. So she had this heart response, and 
it sends an alert to my phone saying she's in immediate danger. And I literally, within 10 seconds, had packed my bag and I was heading out the door. And then she calls me and says, babe, my watch fell off my wrist and it sent you an emergency notice. So, so you can tell even in your imagination when that energy kicks in, but it can start to consume you and control you. And a part of what the enemy is trying to do is freeze you. And I want for a moment, before we jump into our key passage for today, I want us to consider how fear moves us out of probability into possibility. So you start to think about things not rationally anymore, not based upon statistics, but based on imaginary problems. So let me explain it like this. So three of the most common fears that we face, one is glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking. And I remember when I first started as a pastor, I would step on stage to preach, and my face would get really blotchy and red. There's this condition called rosacea, and there was a woman who decided to write it on a connection card and let me know that I should get it checked out by a dermatologist and that my face was really red every time I preached. And I was like, geez, I never knew that. Thank you so much for telling me. I just feel so much better now. So there's glossophobia, there's acrophobia, which is the fear of heights, there's uh, sinophobia, which is the fear of dogs, so those are like a dog bite, those are the three top fears. You've got claustrophobia, fear of enclosed places, ca- castrodophobia, which is the fear of cockroaches. That was for those of you who don't like cockroaches. So what happens is with fear, you, you move out of probability into possibility. So I'll give you some statistics. So planes. Some people fear getting on planes. Did you know that you have a point zero 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 one percent chance of dying in a plane crash? That's wild to think about. Sometimes we get fearful. Heights is another one. Your odds of being injured by falling, jumping, or being pushed from a high place is one in 65,092. So like very low odds. Lightning, here's another one. The odds of being struck by lightning are one in 2.3 million. So if you consider that, so often when you go outside and there's lightning and you're considering, am I going to get struck, it's good to know that your odds of getting struck by a meteorite is one in 700,000, so you are three times more likely to get struck by a meteorite than you are to get struck by lightning. So imagine the odds, like maybe you should be fearful of meteorites, I don't know. Um, Here's another one, dogs. Um, your chance of being bit by a dog is 1 in 137,694. So that's really small. Unless it's a chihuahua, then your odds go up because they bite. If you have a chihuahua, sorry for offending you. I like big dogs. So, um, okay, here's another one. Your odds of being killed by a shark are 1 in 300 million, but your odds of being killed by your spouse is 1 in 135,000. So, you, you see what I'm saying, right? Like, odds, you gotta consider the odds, you know? So it's not like you lay down every night, oh my gosh, I'm next to her again. You know, it's like, <laughs> is she gonna <laughs> bite me in the middle of the sleep? So, what we wanna do today is we, we wanna shift out of that possibility thinking and ground ourselves so that we can move forward by faith. So faith has an ima- imagination and fear has an imagination. Fear is imagining a future without God. Faith is imagining a future in the hands of the creator. And we wanna ground ourselves so that we can move forward. Fear does not diminish if you avoid it. Fear does not get smaller if you ignore it. Fear is only overcome by facing it. So we wanna recognize what is that thing today that oftentimes grips your soul? What is the thing that in your heart, in your mind, has the ability to neutralize you and God wants to give you, wants to give us the confidence, the courage, the strength, the faith to move forward. And we're gonna look at Joshua in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter one. And what I want us to recognize about Joshua, Joshua is the leader that God is choosing as the Israelites are coming out of 40 years in the desert into the promised land. And Joshua has been serving as Moses' aide. He's been walking with him, he's been taking notes, he's been around one of the greatest leaders that the nation of Israel has ever known. Moses dies, 
and God is going to mobilize Joshua as the leader. And this passage of scripture God's used so much in my journey of coming to Saddleback to encourage me. And I want you to hear what God says as he's speaking to Joshua. I want you to imagine the same kind of conversation that God would have with Joshua is the kind of conversation he wants to have with us about our fear. He says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. So God is pointing out the fact the thing that Joshua has relied upon is gone. Undoubtedly, Moses would have been a source of confidence for him. Like so much wisdom, so much insight, understanding of God. So Joshua now has one of his greatest rocks of confidence removed. And God says, Moses is dead but we still need to move forward. And then he says this to him, you get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to you, to the Israelites. I will give every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, and the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now God is speaking directly to Joshua saying, I'm with you, I'm for you, I'm re-emphasizing this promise and now we're going from the desert from 40 years in the wilderness into the promised land. Now in between Joshua and the promised land is a rushing river and there are no bridges There there are no airplanes. There's no way to get across this rushing river. So God is going to have to perform a miracle to get them across. And on the other side of the river, there are all these people groups that they hate the Israelites. And there's going to be war between the Israelites and these people groups. And they're imagining all these things. There's been many moments where they've faced what's on the other side of the Jordan River. And the thing that they need, the thing that God is going to speak into Joshua as a leader and the people of God is courage. Courage to move forward. And watch what God says. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Joshua, as you take my people into the promised land, as you lead one million people across the Jordan River, you cannot drip with fear. You have to be strong and courageous. He says, be strong and very courageous. Like, in fact, If you didn't get it the first time, let me say it a second time. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. So you don't get to choose. Like, well, I like that page of the Bible, and I don't like that page. It's like the whole thing. Stay on the beaten path from my word. Do not turn to the right or the left that you might be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do everything that is written in it and then you will be prosperous and successful. Now one more time, Joshua, just in case you didn't get it. Have I not already commanded you? Now this is interesting. 365 times in the Bible God says, do not be afraid. It's a command for our lives. Have I not commanded you, Joshua? Be strong And courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These are some great words. Now, I think we could all recognize we live in a culture of fear. And over the last four years, isn't it true that fear has increased in society? You know, in 2020, when COVID hit and the fear of death, the fear of illness, the loss of control, but then there's all this social anxiety that so many kids were locked in homes for months on end in front of computer screens and come back out and nobody knows, do you fist bump, do you hug, do you, what do you do? And there's all this confusion that our world is living in right now and there are so few people that have the kind of confidence that God wants them to have. And we're called to a different way of life. We're called to live strong and courageous lives. And God gives Joshua a roadmap for courage. Now the first thing God says I want us to see is God says, you need to know my word. 
You need to know my commandments. You need to get them deep within your soul. You need to understand all of it, Joshua. Notice in verse six and seven, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Now I want you to notice that phrase, all the law. I want you, Joshua, to study it all. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I want you to know it all. Do, don't turn to the right or the left, then you'll be successful. Now, for Joshua, he had the first five books of the Bible that Moses had written. And inside the first five books of the Bible would have been the promise that God made to the people of Israel through Abraham when God said, I will bless you so that you might bless the nations. I will make you great. You will be the father of many nations. And he's speaking, God is speaking to Abraham about a land, but more than just about a land, it's a promise of what he's gonna do through a people. That through the people of Israel, God is gonna raise up a savior. Jesus is gonna come out of the lineage of Abraham. And he's gonna be a savior to the world. And nations that Abraham didn't know would be blessed because of his lineage. So today we're here based on that Abrahamic blessing that God pronounced on him. So Joshua would have had that blessing, that promise that God had said to them, this is the land I'm calling you into. That promise would have given confidence as Joshua read through. Not only did he have the promise, but he had all these stories of God's faithfulness. There's the story that he would have experienced where God split the Red Sea as the Israelites were going through. All the miracles to bring the Israelites out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Over and over again, the faithfulness of God would have been declared. In addition to that, Joshua would have had in the first five books of the Bible the way of life that God was prescribing that was so different from the world around. The values, the precepts, the heart, the things that God values were there tucked within the first five books of the Bible. But that command to know the word of God, it increases the courage in our life. And here's why it does. Because it helps us pick our battles. It helps us recognize that not every battle in front of you is one that is worthy of your attention. There's a lot that's happening in our world. There's more anger than there's ever been. There's bickering. There's people that don't like each other on the left and the right and trying to figure out all this noise. What is the battle that I engage in? Well, every time I pick up this book, God shows me what he cares about. He shows me what he values. And there are things in here like God in the New Testament speaks through his words so much about love. So what God is trying to produce in me is love for the people around me. There's a lot that God says in here about purity of our hearts and our minds. There's so much that God says about his church being a diverse church of people from different backgrounds. There are things in this book that God will get into our hearts the more that we read it and he'll start to show us the battles that we should engage in. And the reason that this is so important is because what the world will teach you is that fear, if you avoid it, it will go away. If you avoid the problem that's in front of you that is causing you fear, somehow it's gonna dissipate. But fear is a liar. And the more that you avoid fear, the very thing that you're afraid of, that fear often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the more you're afraid of it, the more that reality slips into place in so many areas of our life and freezes us from moving into the fullness of what God has for us. And often, the peace that we are longing for, this is important, is on the other side of conflict. It's on the other side of battle. It's on the other side of the fight. And God has placed within you the strength, the courage to fight for the things that matter to fight for the things that are on his heart. I'll tell you one personally right now for me. The more I read the Bible, one of the things that God has been doing in my heart is he's been showing me how in the word of God, he is a multi-generational God. So his love, his precepts, his faithfulness goes from generation to generation. Do you believe that? And here at Saddleback, we have grandparents, we have parents, we have kids, we even have some great grandparents here. We've got generation after generation after generation. And what God has done as you read this book, and I'm seeing it more and more now as I read this book, God has designed the family as the primary place where people grow spiritually. And as a father who is called by God, 
and a wife that's brought together in a marriage and sons and daughters in that home, that God uses the home to bless the home, to strengthen children so that they grow up the next generation understanding the heart of God. So as a 20, being married for 21 years in May, having a 17-year-old son, a 15-year-old son, and a 10-year-old daughter, I am increasingly convinced that the fight in our culture right now is over the value and the significance of the home. That there are demonic forces trying to rip apart marriages, trying to rip children apart from parents. And there's a lot, there are lies that are flying so fast at parents right now that the education system and so much what is happening politically is trying to remove from the family the authority that God has given to parents to disciple their children. If you have a child that is in your home, if you have a child that is in your home, by God, you are called to disciple that child. The education system is not called to disciple your child. And what, what, what the world is trying to do is say, well, you, you don't have what it takes. You gotta have a counselor to parent your kids. You need to have an educational system to parent your kids. And God has called you, and if you are a man that God has made a husband and a father, it is worth your fight to battle for the hearts of your wife and your children. It is worth it to engage. As I read, as I read this book though, what God does is he will put in my heart and he'll put in your heart. Fight for this. Fight for your children. Fight for future generations. Give your heart to become a person of love. Fight to be a part of a community that loves people from different ethnic backgrounds. Fight to be a place where people who are far from God can encounter his love and his mercy. And the enemy wants to put in us an abdication over the things that God cares about. But what God wants to do is insert courage into your life. And that courage comes by knowing his word, but it also comes by obeying his word, number two. So Joshua, chapter one, verse seven. Listen to what God says to Joshua in the same verse. He says, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Now notice that word obey. The obedience is the application of God's truth into our lives. So it's one thing to, to listen to it in our minds and hear it, but it's another thing when it gets into our lives and we act on it. So he's saying, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Now notice, as God is speaking to Joshua, he's talking about the movement of his feet. That There's a forward progress with obedience. And what obedience does is it helps my feet keep moving forward. So faith, what it does is it moves you forward. Fear, what it does is it neutralizes you. So obedience to God helps my feet keep moving forward. Now, this is true when it comes to our lives with fear. If you move forward on fear, the fear goes down. And studies show us right now, even as you look at psychology, one of the primary ways that a psychologist will help with somebody who has fear is they call it exposure therapy. And I'm not a psychologist, don't claim to be. Not a counselor, don't claim to be. I could do damage. But... Uh, this, is, this study is accurate from a, from a statistical standpoint that if you take something you fear, like a, let's say spiders, let's say you've got fear of spiders, exposure therapy, what it does is it says, okay, when you think of spiders, you get fear. But in order to, to overcome that fear, what you have to do is start small and say, okay, well, I'm gonna think about spiders, okay? I think about spiders, I'm staying calm, I'm still me, I still can move forward, and then you draw a spider, and after you draw a spider, you're like, okay, I can see the spider. Then you get in a room with a spider. And then you get a little bit closer to the spider. And then you let the spider touch you. And over time, studies show, somebody's like, I'm never doing that. I'd rather stay afraid of spiders my entire life. But studies show that when you, when you work through fear like that, 90% of people can get through their fear with exposure therapy. Now, I wanna encourage you as you label that fear, to recognize what is the thing that you need to keep moving forward on. Studies um, also show us, I thought this was interesting, some of the most common fears right now in our culture. The top fear right now, through a recent study done, was corrupt government officials. That was the number one. So I don't know 
I think it's probably, I think it's every which way. But um, yeah, that was number one, statistics say. Um, number two is people we love becoming seriously ill. Number three is nuclear weapons. Number four is people we love dying. Number five is a third world war. Pollution of drinking water, not having enough money, economic and financial collapse, pollution of oceans, rivers, and lakes, biological warfare, all that is what people think about right now. And I don't know what yours is, but in order to see that fear diminish, we have to act on it. So the voice of God will speak into your life, into our lives, and call us to move forward. So what's the thing that God has called you to act on, to obey, that you haven't done yet? And what is that fear that God is saying, I want to give you the courage to face it, to move forward? It might be the fear of failure. So deep within your soul, that fear of failure can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like your eyes are turned towards it, and the more your eyes are on it, the more you're not on the path God wants you to be. It might be for some of you a fear financially or a fear with a child and what will happen with their life, but the more we obsess over that fear rather than obsessing over obedience, the more we're moving in the direction of that fear. So God says to Joshua, fix your eyes on obedience. Fix your whole life on listening and doing what I ask you to do. And for me personally, I need a word from God to move forward with the things that require courage. Like when Stacy and I started a church in the San Francisco Bay Area, I needed a word from God in 2008 for that vision. And when God called us to uproot, it, our, uproot our family and move to Saddleback in 22, I needed God to speak to me, because if God gives me a word, I can act on it. If he tells me what to do, I want to do it. But what helps me in that moment, I want to encourage you to write this down, there is a cost to faith and there is a cost to fear. What the enemy will do is he will get you to obsess over the cost of faith rather than getting you to obsess over the cost of fear. And when it comes to fear, as fear neutralizes a person's life, it's affecting you, it's getting in your bones the more you receive it, it's going into future generations, and what we are seeing now, as children are being raised, we are seeing the anxiety of the home being transferred to children. So children are growing up fearful because parents are fearful. So children now, some of you who are about my age will remember you'd go out and play at night and you wouldn't come home until it's dark. But now we have apps and watches and can track down to this one foot where our kids are in the neighborhood. And if they're like three seconds off the radar, we're nervous. And what we need as a, as, a, as a generation, as people, is that kind of courage and confidence to fill our lives so that we can lead those around us. So obedience to the word of God is the call that God is making to Joshua. The third and final thing I want to emphasize is what God says to Joshua about speaking his word. And notice in verse 8, this last verse here, God says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you might be successful to do everything written in it, then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, Joshua, be strong and courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Let it get on your lips, and then as it gets on your lips, let it get down into your mind, into your heart, and let it consume your life. The more you meditate on it, the more you think about it, the more you speak about it, it's coming down into your soul. And what's happening is that as we speak the word of God, it's renewing our mind. It's renewing our mind to the direction and the call that God is placing on our lives. And I've noticed that my mind tends to verge off from what God asked me to do. My mind is constantly distracted. But speaking God's word, this helps me renew my mind. This last week, not only did I go hiking in the Cascade Mountains, but I went mountain biking. And my buddy who we went to visit, who's a pastor uh, there in eastern Washington, he asked me, he said, do, do you like to mountain bike? Are you good at mountain biking? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I didn't tell him it's been 10 years since I rode on a mountain bike. I just said, yeah, I'm good kind of that man confidence. And so we're like riding up this mountain in his truck. 
with the bikes in the back, and he's like, I'm so glad I'm going for a ride with somebody who's good at mountain biking. And I'm like, oh, bro, no, I, it's been 10 years. Like, I'm athletic, but I'm, I am not like what you think when you think about a mountain biker. And he's like, okay, well, I'll take it easy, but we're going to go 3,000 foot up into the mountain, and then when we get up there, we're going to cruise down the side of the mountain, and it's going to be awesome. So I got on my bike, and I'll tell you, I only fell off seven times. That's all. <laughs> but I made it. I'm alive. I did not die. And what I noticed is that my tire was constantly left and right, left and right. And staying on the path is rarely a straight line. It's a constant readjustment of our lives, constantly coming back to center. And that's what the Bible does. That's what God's Word does. When it gets into our minds, our mouths, our hearts, it readjusts us. It realigns us. It helps us keep moving on the path that God calls us to. And what I love, what helps me so much, is to take the word of God, get a couple of verses, memorize them, meditate on them, speak them over my life, bring them up in conversation with people that I'm around, and reinforce for my heart the courage that I know God wants me to have. It's like the world, and it's like my flesh, and it's like the messages of the enemy is moving me into fear, but it's like the word of God is bringing me back and it's, he's filling me up and he's strengthening me and he's pouring out his spirit as I read his word to give me courage and confidence. And I wanna share just a couple of verses that for me personally that I've been meditating on just in the last couple of weeks that are helping me. And what I wanna do as we conclude our message time is I wanna read these verses over you and I wanna invite you just to receive them in your heart to fix your mind on them as you receive them as a word from God over your life and over our church. Psalm 106 says, the people refuse to enter the pleasant land for they wouldn't believe his promise to care for them. So in their mind, they could not conceptualize the goodness and the greatness of God. They would not believe it. So they failed to enter into the promised land. There was a whole generation that got stuck in the desert because they responded in fear. And there was another generation that had faith that moved into the promise. And so much of moving into the promise is our understanding of who God is and what God is like. And when we read the Bible, we see people that had personal encounters with the living God that transformed their life. And they speak of his character. They speak of his nature. And they tell stories of his miracles. Like in Psalm 91, King David writes this. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And then notice how it's made personal. And I will say of the Lord, I will quote to myself, I will preach to my soul, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. He's my God in whom I trust. So as arrows fly at me, as circumstances around me are going into chaos, as the world is struggling, I will find my refuge and my strength and my confidence in the Lord Almighty, who's the creator and the sustainer of the universe. In Psalm 23, verse 4 and 5, King David writes this beautiful psalm, and he says this, even though I walk through the darkest valley." Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, my God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And this image, this is often the verses that I'm quoting to myself as I fall asleep at night and I'm just, I will fear no evil for you are with me, my God. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the image that King David is using, he was a shepherd. And he's using the image of a shepherd walking next to a sheep and a sheep that is going through this dark valley, but they have nothing to fear because the shepherd has them right next to their side. And the rod and the staff is pulling them close as there's threat, as there's danger around, the good shepherd pulls the sheep back in. The good shepherd picks the sheep up into its arm. So there's nothing that we have to fear. And David says that in the midst of the darkest valleys and the battles that are right around us, that he's preparing before me a table set in the presence of my enemies. 
So as there are arrows flying at my head, there's a God that is preparing a feast before me. He's anointing my head with his oil and my cup is overflowing because the goodness, the mercy, the faithfulness, the creator, the sustainer of the universe is with me and he is for me. Oh friend, I want you to listen to me. Maybe you're drifting out thinking about lunch right now. Come back. I want you to hear this because this is the most important part of the whole message. There is a God who created the universe, every star in the sky, all the planets, all the, the seas of the ocean, every fish, every type of animal that crawls along the planet, mankind, he's the creator that spoke it into existence. He's the one that holds the world on its axis and keeps the world and the universe running. He's the God that is able to care for everything that is entrusted into his hands. And he's near, he's personal. He is able in your deepest, darkest moment to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you. He's with you in cancer. He's with you in divorce. He's with you in depression. He's with you in loneliness. He's with you in your loss. He's with you in your poverty. He's with you. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now why is this true? John would speak of the love of God and I'm going to finish on this. He says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Why is that? That perfect love casts out fear. The reason why is because deep within our soul, if we understand the perfect love of God, we understand that this life is not all that there is. So somebody can write on a connection card, you got rosacea, and the next week, what changed? Somebody cannot like you at your place of work. Financially, you can struggle. All of these things that come at you. But if you know the love of God, and he is with you, he's for you, all of the fear, he will remind your soul, I got you. I got you. I got you in my arms. I'm carrying you like a shepherd. I'm with you. I'm for you. Now that deepest, darkest, <clears throat> That deepest, darkest fear, the fear of death that crawls into our soul. Some of you live with that fear and you don't know when this life is going to be over. And the reason why that fear settles in on the soul is because we all know people who've died. We know that that is ultimately, physically on this planet, that's our destiny. And there's gonna be a moment where we breathe our last breath here on planet Earth and we stand before a holy and righteous God and the question that he's going to ask us is, what did we do with the message of Jesus? What did we do with the message of his death on a cross for our sins? What did we do with the message of his resurrection and the offer to receive God's forgiveness into our life? That will be the question that will determine whether or not we spend eternity with God. And when you nail that down, and we understand deep within our soul that he's got us for all eternity, there's a courage that we can live with. There's a courage that can give us the strength to stand. And if you've never received that perfect love into your life, I wanna invite you to do it right now. If you'll close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment, and perhaps today you're at that place you don't know for certain that you have a relationship with God. Today you can seal the deal, you can be confident, you can know that you know that you know that you have a relationship with God by confessing with your lips and believing in your heart that Jesus died on a cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. And you can surrender right now in this moment. If that's you, I wanna invite you to say this prayer just to say, dear Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. I believe that you conquered the grave and I'm surrendering my life to you right now in this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to celebrate with you. You just, you just made the most important decision of your entire life, and I want to know that you made that decision. Now, just before we're wrapping up here, I just got a couple of things I want to share with you. If you just prayed that prayer, when you check in on the app or on our digital program, just let me know that I made a decision to follow Jesus. Just click that button, and we'll send you some resources. 
And if you want to talk to somebody or pray together, swing by the hub on your way out. The team's there and would love just to pray with you and kind of talk through that decision. We have a Bible we can put in your hands. Uh, also, you can sign up for Activate or Baptism as you check in today. But before we conclude, one final thing I do want to say. I've got a story to share that's way too good not to share. Many of you guys know uh, we are a multi-site church. We're a church that's all over the world, so we got campuses in four locations, five locations globally. One of those is in the Philippines, in Santa Rosa, Philippines, and that campus is just busting out of the seams, growing, expanding their space, uh, but they're also multiplying. So there was a group of people that left the Santa Rosa campus. They went to the southern part of the Philippines to a town called Davao. And when they got there, they said, you know what, we're gonna start an extension of Saddleback, which is not yet a campus. It's a group of people meeting together, watching the messages, talking, kind of conversing and doing life together. And we're gonna start this extension. They're connected to a prison there. People are coming out of the prison, joining them. People in the prison are joining along with Saddleback. So they started this group. It's grown already to 60 people. So 60 people are coming. And um, I saw this last week, I got a text that I thought was amazing. The leader of the extension sent me a text that said, they decided because the whole church is doing Activate, they're gonna do it as well. So 36 people showed up last week at their Activate. This is a picture I want you to see. And at that Activate, 10 people made a first time decision to follow Jesus, six made a decision to get baptized, and 26 committed to being a part of Saddleback. And I just love, I love to connect the dots on what God is doing through you all over the world. So thank you for praying, thank you for serving, thank you for giving. God is using you to impact people's lives all over the world. So when we give today as a church family, we give with gratitude, we give because of what God's done, we give to contribute to the vision of God's kingdom coming to every corner of the planet. You can do that online through the app, you can do it at our website. You can do it at the kiosks as you're leaving. But most importantly, our heart is that we would give out of a thankful heart for what God has done in our lives. I wanna invite you to stand uh, with us and I'm gonna pray a prayer of blessing over you as we're dismissed. And I'll remind you next week, we're gonna talk about relationships, broken relationships. And so that'd be a great opportunity to bring somebody with you that might need some help in that area of their life. Father, we thank you today Thank you for every person in this room that you deeply love. And I'm so grateful, Holy Spirit, that you are near and present and are more than enough for every need of every person and for all of our fears, God. Your presence, your power, your nearness is the strength we need to overcome and live with courage. And I pray that as we go, you would make us bold, that you'd make us courageous, that you would make us a people that stand out from the world around us because the courage you deposit into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.